Good evening, everyone. My name is Eleanor Harvey. I'm the senior curator of 18th and 19th century art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I'd like each of the panelists, if you would, to go ahead and turn on your cameras um, and let me introduce each one of you. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Amy Kalupka, who's the curator of art at the Whatcom Museum in Bellingham, Washington, um, a role she has had, held since 2019. She also serves as the chair of the City of Bellingham's Arts Commission and Percent for Art program. Before this, she taught studio art and professional practices at Western Washington University and held a curatorial position at the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. We also have tonight Melanie Fales, the executive director and CEO of the Boise Art Museum, who also serves as the BAM's curator of art for this partnership program for many Wests. Melanie holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History and Painting and a Master of Arts in Art Education from Boise State University. She was awarded a Rotary International, um, I'm sorry, she was awarded a Rotary International Ambassadorial Graduate Scholarship and pursued Art History and Museum Studies at the Ecole de Louvre in Paris, France. Melanie also volunteers on the board of the Regional Western Museums Association and is a member of the National Association of Art Museum Directors. Anne Hyland, my colleague, is the Art Bridges Initiative Curatorial Coordinator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and serves as the curator for many Wests at SAM. Prior to her multifaceted role under our roof, she worked at Glenstone Museum in Potomac, Maryland in the Visitor Experience and Archives Department. Anne holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from George Mason University and is currently completing a Master of Arts in Museum Studies from Harvard University Extension School. Danielle Knapp is the Makash Curator at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon in Eugene and a specialist in Pacific Northwest art. At JSMA, she oversees the David John and Ann Kutka Makash Memorial Collection and Archive and the museum's significant holdings of American and regional art. Danielle curates exhibitions of historical and contemporary art and supports museum initiatives in these areas, including acquisitions, publications, and academic programming. Danielle received her master's in art history and a graduate certificate in museum studies from the University of Oregon and holds a BA in art history and French from Eastern Washington University. And finally, Alyssa McCusker is the senior curator and curator of European and American art at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts and the Utah at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Mm. She assumed this role amidst the ongoing Sam and Art Bridges cohort program with Western Museums and curated this exhibition for UMFA. Previously, she served as curator of European and American art at the Museum of Art and Archaeology at the University of Missouri. She has a doctorate in art history from the University of Texas at Austin and received a Fulbright full year fellowship to Germany for her dissertation research. Welcome to all of you tonight. It is so nice to be able to see all of you here. Um, I've got a million questions and I'm sure our audience will have more of them, um, but I also know that you have questions for each other. So I wanna kick this off by, uh, by asking Anne, if you'll do me a favor and explain how this partnership came to be and what prompted Sam to partner with these specific museums in the Western United States? Sure, I would love to. Um, so this story goes back uh, to 2018 when uh, Stephanie Stevich, our director, was working with um, the Art Bridges Foundation. And mm -hmm. what they have is a cohort program that partners larger collection museums, um, such as SAM, mm -hmm. um, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, the LA County Museum of Art in California, with um, smaller museums uh, to cross collection share and um, kind of get professional development programming going and really kind of um, spread your reach uh, in, in these larger collections. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam had a very ambitious uh, idea in mind that instead of working with regional institutions in the Washington area, we would um, go across the country and see what, uh, what American collections we could work with in the Western US. And so in 2018 and 2019, um, Carmen Ramos, our former head curator, and uh, Virginia Mecklenburg, our senior curator, uh, went to a number of institutions and chose uh, the four institutions that you see here, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, the Whatcom Museum, 
the Jordan Schnitzer Museum at the University of Oregon and the Boise Art Museum uh, in Idaho because they had these rapidly growing populations, um, rapidly diversifying populations. And so we thought what better way to spread Sam's collection than work with um, institutions across the nation. And what we have um, come up with with Many Wests is a, a true collaborative curated show. So each of the institutions put forth a number of objects from our own collections to tell a larger story of American art. And, um, you know, we were able to kind of look at our own collections introspectively, but also trust our partners to pick works that would speak to a larger narrative of um, kind of dismantling the myths in the American West. It must have been complicated by the pandemic. Complicated is definitely one one word to use, you know. Um, we're here on Zoom tonight, and this mm -hmm. is something that we did for the course of, um, you know, two years, basically. Uh, we were meant to meet in person in a convening in Washington in April of 2020, and we all know what happened um, just prior to that. And so yeah. for about two years, we spent... Uh, hours each week on Zoom, um, planning the exhibition, writing the text, um, checking in on each other. Uh, you know, it was it was extremely difficult with um, all of us having, you know, being in disparate regions with um, varying degrees of the pandemic in our own communities. Mm -hmm. um, some of us with uh, children to take care of and the complications that, that came with the pandemic, but really having to put pen to paper to, um, Put, put an exhibition together, it, it was quite difficult. So to kind of jump into the meat of it, um, mm -hmm. Danielle, I wanted to ask you if you could speak a little bit about how um, the title and, and the concept of the show came to be with, with Many Wests. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. Uh, you've already provided a little nice introduction, a teaser of what the show is about and what you described, Dan. Um, and so I can expand on that a little more and certainly talk about the title um, to launch the rest of our conversation. But uh, Many West brings together works by modern and contemporary artists um, as part of a larger sort of examination of the idea of the American West, um, both in popular culture as it's been informed by art and image making mm -hmm. and in sort of commonly accepted historical narratives that we may or may not have been taught a version or multiple versions of from school all the way through um, adulthood. And so I think that um, this initial invitation to participate as part of Art Bridges and Sam's collaboration was really exciting, of course, for um, the museums in our region. But um, it was also this opportunity, I think it presented immediately what you also mentioned, this idea of um, this opportunity for self-reflection, I think personally and institutionally, to think about well, what does it mean to be a museum in the West or of the West? Um, I don't think any of our museums describe ourselves as museums of the American West or collecting American Western art mm -hmm. in, in that way, but that's certainly part of a sort of a larger way we might think about or place ourselves um, as museums representing our localities, representing mm -hmm. communities, and then working with artists within our region and artists beyond our region. Um, and that's only thinking about contemporary and living artists. We have the honor of you know, knowing firsthand, but also our collections include historical objects and speak to traditions further back in time or further apart geographically. So um, thinking about our role as a museum in the West offered a, a different sort of, for me, a way of looking at the work that I'm already doing at the museum. Um, and so that made us ask ourselves some interesting questions as we were conceiving an idea for an exhibition, thinking about our collections practices, our exhibition programming, um, our museum's mission, um, and what are we doing that already engages with or challenges any widely held misconceptions about the West, what artworks acknowledge the uh, multiple lived experiences here. And so all of that, I think, fed into um, thinking about a title, which for me is often the hardest part, um, one of the hardest parts of the exhibition, um, to make a decision about a title and all the ways that that needs to reflect, um, you know, the what a show might be about, what its theoretical or curatorial thesis is. Um, so I think we we bounced around a couple of ideas with titles and then decided on Many West Artist Shape an American Idea. I think that title came as a recognition of what was exactly at the heart of our curatorial inquiry, our goals for the exhibition. Um, I think this nod towards multiplicity, 
um, about sort of different experiences of the West. And I, you know, we kind of imply quotations around that a lot when we're talking about that as a concept. Um, also reflects this incredible opportunity to work among other partner museums and select from so many works in our collections. Um, and think about how we can develop a checklist pulling from those strengths, going back to works, artists in our collection and what we have to learn from them. And so we had many points of view right from the start. So I think that was a wonderful aspect of this um, of this project. And so I think the subtitle that our, you know, artists shape an American idea is equally important to our concept, mm -hmm. because obviously our perceptions of the world are shaped by visual imagery. Uh, visual experiences all the time. And so I really like that the subtitle felt active, that it mm -hmm. situated the artists as the, you know, having agency and making images, influencing hearts and minds, what their creative output does to document experiences, to sort of shape perception of something. And so this acknowledges the way that images and artistic meaning making have mm -hmm. shaped historical and public conceptions of the West as a region and what um, you know, we're we're kind of wanting to put the artists forward, what we can learn from from their work. Um, and with that too, saying, you know, an American idea, that also establishes this is a concept. This is not an American truth or an American history. This is an American idea and um, all the ways we might read meaning into that. And that's um, a question that uh, Melanie can speak more to because we wanted to also talk about how do the artists in this show challenge traditional perceptions of the American West and what impact does that have on the broader cultural landscape? So I'll defer to Melanie to pick up that question next. Thank you, Danielle. And that was so well said. And as we all know, there are stereotypical perceptions of the American West that have been perpetuated through pop culture, especially in movies and books. And these pop culture ideas present a one-dimensional perspective of the West that is often inaccurate and romanticized and even exaggerated. And the artists in this exhibition challenge those stereotypical perceptions of the West by sharing the stories of their cultural heritage and lived experiences in the West, as Danielle mentioned. These are the unknown histories or histories that have been set aside in the common or traditional stories of the West. And by sharing their personal stories, the artists open a dialogue so that people can consider that there are many perspectives, many viewpoints, and many experiences that make up the American West beyond that singular pop culture stereotype. Visitors really are invited to connect with the artist's personal stories of the West with its many layers of history that have evolved over time and with a diversity of experiences. And this helps people have greater cultural understanding and appreciation and compassion and brings people together. These artists, I think, also inspire the next generation of artists to share their perspectives, even when, and or I should say, actually, especially when, they differ from the dominant story. And so with that, I'm going to ask you, Alyssa, what role does art play in shaping and redefining the cultural mythology surrounding the American West? Not a small question. Thanks so much, Melanie. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that question really gets to the heart of this exhibition and this whole project, right? Because art is an essential component of any cultural mythology. And mythology is an apt word because myths are stories and legends. Um, and they are also sometimes um, falsehoods, right? <laughs> that are perpetuated. Um, so I'm really thinking about the term myth as it originated with the Greek word, you know, mythos. So myths as collected narratives that hold great significance for a culture. And the West is truly a mythology of the modern age as we have inherited it. Um, and it is a major component of the larger mythologies about the United States and the Americas more widely. It contains stories and legends of all kinds, from the comic to the tragic, and these encompass every theme about the nature of the world and the human experience within it. Um, many of the prevailing ideas we associate with the West uh, immediately conjure up images for us. And I'm sure images come to mind just if I throw out a few keywords for us and our, um, and our audience. So stunning landscapes, vast open spaces, wilderness and wildness, mm -hmm 
indigenous people who are mysterious and exotic. I'm sure we can all think of a cast of various characters like frontiersmen, pioneer families, 49ers and cowboys. Most of the images that come to mind if we really think about this originate in art, whether it's written or oral like um, or heard like literature, poetry and music or it's visual like fine art, popular art and motion pictures. So a fascinating aspect of analyzing the mythology of the West is that so many of these accepted stories are told by those from outside the region. Most of the great Western landscape paintings of the 19th century, if you think of them in your mind, were painted by Easterners. Mm -hmm. They were either tourists or migrants, almost all of which were of European descent. Later, Hollywood produced films to make money by being popular, and that meant attracting audiences with money in the more populist Eastern and Midwestern regions of the United States. So what we realize then is that art about the West has created a stronger impression in our cultural awareness than art from the West itself. The prevailing mythology that we have received has really supplanted millennia of native and indigenous mythologies. And as Melanie already explained, it's romanticized, stereotyped, prejudiced, mm -hmm. often inaccurate or only partly accurate. So that is why it was so important to the curators of this ex exhibition that the art be by artists from the West or living and working in the West, and that the art reflect a variety of perspectives that remind us that prevailing mythologies often oversimplify. Mm -hmm. They often over obscure the more complicated and in interesting individual stories that make up real lived experience. Uh, the land and the peoples of the West have always been pluralistic, so we have many Wests. Um, and one of the ways that the curators um, worked through how to tell this story was by breaking the exhibition up into three primary sections, um, diving deeper into these ideas of challenging traditional notions or mythologies of the West. So I would just like to ask Amy, um, how did the curatorial de team decide upon the three sections, which are caretakers, memory makers, and boundary breakers, besides, of course, the perfect rhyming scheme there? Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, I, I had to go back into some email chains and really jog my memory on this since it's been three years since we started those conversations and really, so you all can check me on my memory, my, I don't know that I have the best memory here, but I, from, from what I remember, I, I really felt like we started our conversations really getting to know each other and getting to know not each other just as colleagues, but uh, our collections and what our regions are about and what, what, what's, what we have to offer from each of our collections to this story. So there were many, many meetings that we were essentially sharing slide presentations of what we had in our collections. Some of the works are very regionally specific. Um, there was some overlap across some of our collections. And it was just a really wonderful period of time where we got comfortable and aware of what we all had to offer to this project. And as we looked at the artwork and thought about some of these relationships, we really started to understand a little bit more that there were some themes that kept floating to the top as we started to narrow down the final list of artists. And, you know, we really did at the very early stages when we were meeting, talk about the people of the West and the, and the, um, the people's experiences of living in the West. So tying ideas of identity to the artworks was um, sort of an early, an early theme for us. Um, and, you know, some of the other major themes that started to float to the top were um, aspects of storytelling and witnessing, you know, first person experiences, emphasis on community, stewardship of the land and resilience, and again, disrupting myths and stereotypes and ongoing lived migrations. Um, and so we saw how our collections were coming together under a lot of these repeated uh, themes. And, you know, we had a, we started to have a list of about 50 artists, 50 or so artists. And that's, that's a lot of artists in a project. It's really big. So we really wanted to create a scaffolding for the exhibition to be able to tell that story. And we came around to this idea of creating these three groupings. 
And again, these groupings, boundary breakers, memory makers, and caretakers, it really goes back to the artists being actively being these, these um, sections. So artists as memory makers, as caretakers, as boundary breakers, and um, deliberately uh, pointing to those artists' experiences um, and identities. And I think um, it was really helpful for us to create this, these three categories and thinking about how boundary breakers might include, you know, iconoclasts or ideas of hybridity and fluidity, but also stories about migration um, and um, border stories. So it, uh, even when you think about that category, it kind of encompasses multiple aspects of the idea of breaking boundaries. Memory makers really talks, uh, speaks to ideas of witnessing and um, discussing um, forgotten histories, um, first person perspectives and experiences and caretakers really encompasses ideas of caretaking of the self or community or even the land. So even though they kind of are simplified, they really do broaden out and overlap as, uh, as major categories. And it was helpful for us as we had to organize this exhibition for each of our institutions and we each, mm -hmm. each each of our institutions are vastly different. We have architectures that we have to abide by and we have to tell stories in, in different ways as people walk through our spaces in different ways. So to have these categories that overlap and also organize really allowed us the flexibility to place artworks in our spaces in ways that made the most sense for creating those stories and the way people walk through our spaces, so. Oh, that's fantastic because I, I do know that the architecture does change. Um, I know that there, in, in pulling all of this together, each of you also had works of art that you felt were absolutely essential in order to make this successful. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I wanna do at this point is um, share my screen and to basically um, get to the, uh, the notion of how we are looking at these artworks um, in their situation. So what you see here is an installation slide from the Smithsonian Ar American Art Museum. This is the view that you get sort of as you walk in um, the, uh, the front door of the exhibition. And what I'm gonna do is um, ask each of you to, to speak a little bit about why this particular work was so important to you to have front and center in this exhibition. Yeah, and the first work that comes up that you also would have just seen in the installation photo that Eleanor just shared as well uh, is a piece by Marie Watt. Um, so there it is on the right with another work by Marie Watt on the left. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a piece that um, was really immediately came to mind as our exhibition idea was developing um, from GSMA's holdings, thinking about this work that we acquired a couple of years ago, right after um, Marie had made this piece. She's an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation of Indians and also has German and Scott ancestry. And um, she's based in Portland, Oregon, um, and works in multimedia, um, works with textiles, blankets frequently and specifically um, for artistic reasons, and but also makes prints and makes um, sculpture. And her large textile lent by JSMA um, from Minnie West is titled Witness. And this is one in a larger body of work that Watt made in response to a 1913 photo of a Kwamitan potlatch off Vancouver Island. And I think in the chat, um, colleagues might be able to provide the link to Marie Watt's website where she shares that historical photograph and other objects from the, the larger body of work. But I was immediately interested in presenting this piece in the show because I think Watt's skill and sensitivity in using different materials to convey multi-layered considerations of community and memory and history is really, really powerful. And the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish indigenous nations depicted in the photograph she was responding to extend all the way from the Oregon coast, north through Washington state, up into British Columbia, um, where I'm located in Eugene, Oregon, we're on Kalapuya Ilahi, uh, the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people. And so this is outside of the region that I'm participating in the call from, but further north, um, northwest in Oregon. And the potlatch is a long practice, traditional gift giving ceremony with great significance and to the economic and social structure of this community. And so at the time of the original photograph that Marie quotes from in this, where she's embroidered the imagery of um, the community members gathered and in 1913, this would have been an illegal act because both Canada and the United States had outlawed 
traditional religious customs practiced by indigenous peoples as part of the larger suppression um, of native ways of life. And so this is an act of civil dis disobedience that the community photographed were gathered. The fact that Marie Watt has um, chosen a Hudson Bay point blanket as the background on which to display this scene is very significant. And you can see these trademark stripes in green, red, and yellow, and black that identify it if, as those blankets. Um, but you can also see a blanket flying through the air along the upper edge of this work, as was depicted in the photograph. But then she's made some really interesting additions, some tweaks to the image. On the right, you see a stack of blankets that references perhaps her own sculptural practice, um, working with blankets or carving stacks of blankets, like the work from the Boise Art Museum's collection that was shown. Um, but also the idea of gift giving being such an important part of a potlatch that there are stories of gifts and blankets being piled all the way to the ceiling. And so um, I think if we circle back around in our later conversation, there's other connections with this work, why it made sense for our checklist and how it connects to other artists that I would like to talk more about. Um, but I, before I pass off to the next curator, I want to also just point out that Marie has inserted a couple other changes into the image. She inserted her own um, you know, her own self-portrait on the right. You see she's the figure next to the stack of blankets. Her daughter, her older daughter is holding her arm and then her younger daughter is peering over, looking at us, the viewer. So we might be thinking about witness as a person or as an action or as a call to action. And um, far in the distance, in the center of the crowd, she's changed the figures whose arms would have been reaching up perhaps to catch the blankets being shared um, she's changed some of those images into fists, perhaps representing protest or solidarity or strength. And so um, this was really important to me to, to want to share with many of us when we're thinking about boundaries, too, that political boundaries, like the line between the United States and Canada, does not mean that the boundaries of the Indigenous people's homelands that extend through that area are um, you know, no longer there. And so... Um, I'll, I'll move along to the next curator, but I'd love to return and talk more about this if we have time. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, another two works here, um, I, I think were really just incredibly strong when I saw them installed at SAM, and I'm interested in hearing more about them. Thank you, Eleanor. Well, as Anne and Amy mentioned, we focused on the strengths of our individual museums collections when proposing artworks for the exhibition. And when considering Boise Art Museum's collection and thinking about the thesis for our exhibition, I wanted to make sure the powerful perspectives of Roger Shimomura and Wendy Murayama were shared so that a tragic and little known history of the West could be told through their artworks. Mm -hmm. Both artists are telling the story of Camp Minidoka in Idaho, one of 10 inland war relocation centers as the government called them at that time that were established by Executive Order 9066 by President Franklin D. Roosevelt following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. From 1942 to 1945, more than 13,000 individuals were incarcerated at Camp Minidoka in Idaho in tar paper covered barracks covered by, or excuse me, surrounded by guard towers and barbed wire fences. More than 120,000 Japanese Americans and legal resident aliens of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated in the 10 incarceration camps. And this history really remains relatively unknown, even among the families of the people who were imprisoned here. Roger Shimomura created the painting on the right side of the screen titled American Infamy Number no. 2, Roger was actually born in Seattle in 1939 as a sensei or third generation Japanese American. And despite being American citizens, the Shimamuras were incarcerated at Minidoka for two years when Roger was a toddler. Mm. This painting depicts Roger's response to the experience of Camp Minidoka, where he and his family were incarcerated from the spring of 1942 until the summer of 19. 44, which would have been, he would have been between three and five years old at the time. The painting illustrates the layout of the camp with the silhouette of an armed guard watching over the barracks and Japanese American citizens carrying out their daily routines below. The format of the painting is based on 14th and 15th century traditional Japanese screens. 
Then Wendy Murayama's sculpture on the left is titled Minidoka from the TAG project. When um, Wendy first became aware of the incarceration of Japanese Americans through government documentary photographs by Dorothea Lang and Toyo Miyataki. So although her family was directly impacted, they chose not to talk about the experience as she was growing up. Her entire TAG project consists of 10 large scale suspended sculptures, each one representing the individual people in each camp. During World War II, each man, woman, and child was issued a paper luggage style tag with their name, a government issued number, and their designated camp. And each incarceree was required to wear the tag pinned to their clothing while they were being sent to the camps. Wendy realized that the tags were emblematic of the experience and decided to work with volunteers to faithfully recreate the tags with the names, numbers, and camp names for all 120,000 incarcerees. This tag bundle includes tags that represent more than 11,000 people who were incarcerated at Camp Minidoka in Idaho during the year 1942. It's a powerful and overwhelming visual reminder of the number of people impacted by this act of government. When uh, Roger Shimamura and Wendy Mariyama provide a personal perspective that ensures the individual people who were incarcerated in Minidoka do not disappear from memory. So they really are memory makers. <laughs> they communicate a story of racial injustice and also of resilience, perseverance, and resolve that fit into the larger human history of the West. And so their artworks immediately came to mind for me, Eleanor. That's fantastic. They're incredibly powerful works. I remember walking in and seeing the Wendy Marayama piece and just stopping in my tracks. Um, another piece, having grown up on TV Westerns, um, I thought that what Rafael Montanez Ortiz did in this is pretty spectacular. And do you want to talk to us about this? Sure, I would love to. Um, so what you see is a series of stills from Rafael Montañez Ortiz's cowboy and Indian film. Um, and Ortiz was working in a style that was really kind of progressive at the time. He had been working in abstract expressionism alongside, you know, the big names of Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, um, but was really not a mainstream artist at the time. Um, and he started to experiment a little bit more with um, this idea of destruction as a form of art. Mm -hmm. And so in this piece, what he's done is um, he collected a number of um, copies of Winchester 73, which was a very, very popular Western film uh, that was produced in 1950. And he took uh, these copies of the film and with a tomahawk, chopped the film into pieces and then put them in a medicine bag. And while chanting um, kind of performed this interesting um, ritualistic uh, re-splicing of the film. And so what you see are these um, kind of backwards and upside down and really kind of um, disorienting visuals of something that you get these little sort of snippets of, of something familiar. I know there's a very um, uh, iconic close up of one of the actors um, riding on horseback, but then you see in this third uh, still on the bottom is completely inverted. Mm -hmm. And so what um, Ortiz is thinking about in, in both his own identity as um, an indigenous, uh, a person of indigenous descent is really um, redeeming the indigenous wound as he has said, and um, taking the stereotype of the typical cowboy and Indian film that was really popular popular in the mid 20th century mm -hmm. and quite literally destroying it and flipping it on its head. Um, yeah. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about this work in particular is it's actually one of the um, older works in, in the show. So this was done in the late 1950s and it was really uh, ahead of its time in, ter in terms of experimental filmmaking. And Ortiz was not given um, you know, the recognition for this really um, avant-garde work that he was doing. Um, and uh, another thing I really love about this work when you encounter it in the galleries, it, um, you know, I, as I said, you get that 
snippet of of something familiar but you're really kind of you have to pause and take a moment and really digest what you're looking at and it really kind of forces this contemplation whether um it's conscious or unconscious and the sound as well is also um kind of inverted and backwards and nonsensical and a little bit disorienting and every time i walk into the gallery you can hear the kind of galloping of horses mm -hmm. or the you know the shooting of of firearms and you you but it it it's in an order that doesn't quite uh, make sense. And so when we were talking about works from Sam's collection for the show, this was one that really um, kind of encompassed the thesis and, and the ideas that we were bringing together and the sense of, um, in, in this case, a, a boundary breaker who was really interested um, at a at a pretty interesting time in U.S. history of um, addressing Eurocentric um, perspectives and and those perspectives that were kind of implemented and um kind of assigned to people of indigenous uh of indigenous descent and um you know he's also thinking about not only his own indigenous identity but kind of this constellation of communities that um you know, span the the North American continent and really kind of performing this this ritual as a means to kind of um, break apart that stereotype for a number of different people of different backgrounds. Fantastic. Um, I must admit, I was a little surprised to find Jacob Lawrence in this exhibition. Um, not someone I would have necessarily expected. So I'm really interested in uh, in hearing what you have to say about this. Well, I'll talk a little bit about why you might be surprised <laughs> about that, but um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, this is a piece obviously from our collection that mm -hmm. um, we are very, we, we, we're, we love this piece, um, and we know that all of the institutions have been taking wonderful care of it while it's been away, and we're excited to see it when it comes back, but um, I did want to include The Builders uh, by Jacob Lawrence, um, because he is often considered, you know, an artist from the East, but um, he spent the last three decades of his career in the West and built community out here. And that is not part of his biography that is oh. um, really um, presented in the East at all. So I think that was a, that was sort of a way to kind of like jar audiences into uh -huh. under, trying to understand why he might have a place in this exhibition. Uh -huh. so, um, you know, Obviously, he's hailed as a major American artist of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He has a wonderful gift as a careful observer of the everyday and storytelling, and especially uh, in the way that he powerfully expresses Amer African American experiences and histories. Um, and again, many critics and writers really um, detail his life and career from a New York perspective and really focus on the influences of his artistic mentors, such as Charles Alston and Augusta Savage and his participation in the WPA and um, in the um, artist project with that and his proximity to the Harlem Renaissance as a young student. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are sort of the frameworks that we have traditionally understood Jacob Lawrence. Um, but he is an artist, again, he spent three decades, the last three decades of his life in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, and he um, really cultivated artistic communities out here. Um, and this is a, a point and period of time that was that's not mentioned on the collection pages of MoMA or the Whitney or, or um, in um, articles about his work, about um, his many great series on builders and migration and, and, um, and um, some of these histories. So, he spent decades um, really building community. He has many students who consider him a wonderful mentor, including mm -hmm. another uh, many West artist, Barbara Earl Thomas, mm -hmm. who was a student of his. And you can see a lot of parallels between his graphic narrative style and her graphic narrative style and her cutouts and her printmaking. And this particular theme of the builders is one that he returned to time and again in his work across decades. Mm -hmm. um, there's a piece from 1947, a temper uh, on paper yeah. that's in the green room of the White House titled mm -hmm. The Builders. Yep. And this particular piece um, um, titled The Builders was from 1980. So he was 10 years um, in the West after, at the time he painted this piece. Um, and, you know, more broadly, this 
this um, image and the idea speaks to the great migration of African Americans who left the rural American South after World War I and primarily relocated to urban cities in the North, but eventually to the West. So um, after World War II or during World War II, a lot of industry to build military um, equipment and um, ships happened in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, when you think about the Great Migration, you really think of people moving north, but they also yeah. came this way as well, and it was part of a continue, yeah. continuing migration, mm -hmm. and that migration extends to Jacob Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his family originated from the south, and they moved up north to New Jersey, and then he later uh, moved to the Pacific Northwest to take a tenure-track position at the University of Washington in 1970. So, the piece itself, um, it reflects, you know, the building of cities, but also the building of communities and new lives. Um, in the painting, we see workers that are actively and collectively taking part in creating the greater whole. Mm -hmm. um, it's super colorful. And, and one of the things that I love about the style is it's, you know, it's a flat um, painting. There's not a lot of depth of field. So it almost looks like a puzzle where every single piece and every single shape is interconnected with the next. So yeah it's almost as if it belongs, it's so interconnected. And if you took one piece out, it would all fall apart. So um, there's just this great visual link to this idea of the collective whole in the piece. And it really does speak to ideas of aspiration and perseverance and progress. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, mm -hmm. we've got this fabulous piece um, from the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Um, let's hear more about it. Yes, so I, I do have to preface this by saying that I did not select this work of art for the exhibition. Okay. I just want to give a shout out to Whitney Tassie, who is my predecessor here at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and not only did she select this work for the exhibition, but acquired it. Um, she proposed it to our, our collections committee here. So this is a, a work we're really proud to have in the exhibition. It's titled Delimitations. Um, and it's an entire portfolio of 48 uh, photographs that references um, a site-specific installation by um, two artists, Marco, Marcos Ramirez Erre and David Taylor. And we were fortunate to have um, Marcos and David at the UMFA um, during the course of Many Wests. They, were, they gave a, an artist talk for us and it was really wonderful. Um, to see their dynamic and how they um, were sort of, it, I mean, they're reminiscing about this project at this mm -hmm. point, because this was, um, this was a month long installation that they did together. Wow. They refer to themselves as the binational commission. Um, Marcos is from Tijuana, Mexico, and David Taylor is American. He um, grew up in the East coast and, and now is um, in the esteemed program at the School of Art at the University of Arizona. And they were included in an exhibition previously, that's how they met, um, and started talking about their interest in notions about um, borderlands, mm -hmm. um, the, the abstraction of, the, of the, the idea of the political border, um, and then conceived of this, the, the plan for this installation. And what it is is, um, a 2300 mile site specific installation and it maps a historical border between the United States and Mexico when Mexico really was New Spain it was a colony of Spain and it's it's um this border was described in the Adams Onis Treaty of um 1819 that was sort of ratified and approved in 1821 between the kingdom of Spain and the new Republic of the United States of America. Um, and according to this treaty, this, this border as it was described would last forever. And as we know, it did not last <laughs> forever. It actually lasted about 27 years. Yeah. Um, this border was never surveyed and its boundaries were entirely political, ab geographical abstractions that referred to latitudes, longitudes, and rivers as delineations. And of course, this border crisscrossed over lands that had been important to and, and sacred to indigenous peoples for millennia. Um, and this work is so significant for this exhibition because it really illustrates the connection of past and present that I think so many works in this exhibition do really powerfully 
reminding us that the, you know, of the idea that history is still with us. It's not that these things just sort of disappear or are, we can talk about them um, as things that, that have no impact on us today. Um, and, you know, one thing that was really eye-opening for our audiences here at, in Utah is that Utah, the entirety of the state was once part of New Spain. And then when um, Mexico, uh, you know, fought for its independence from Spain, it was part of Mexico because Mexico and the United States essentially re-upped the adams onis Treaty uh -huh. um, a, a few years after its initial approval. Um, so I just include in this slide the image on the left, which is a Google map that I did for our, our programming here, just showing the these are all the locations that um, Marcos and David drove together. They got to know each other very well driving this entire border. And each of the photographs is from one of these sites. So it, it, the photograph number one begins in the Pacific Northwest. So essentially at the present day border between California and Oregon. And then it's it sort of wends its way um, at each one of those points so that the final photograph is actually the 47th photograph, the 47th marker um, is at, in Eastern Texas, just at the mouth of the Sabine River. And then the final picture, which I really love is actually their van, which they drove around in for a, for a month doing this project. Um, and this really was a kind of a guerrilla project. Um, they they went out and they placed as many of these on public lands as they could. When they placed these, when they had to place them in some way on indigenous lands mm -hmm. um, or on privately held lands, they they got approval to do so. Um, and one of the, the really wonderful things also about this this work that. Um, turned out to remind us of just how important it was for this exhibition too, is the, all of the stories that each one of these locations sort of has and the whole experience of them you know, traversing the United States um, and, and reviewing history in this way, but then um, reminding people of what history had been here. Um, and then the stories that they took away from those experiences and all of the different people they met um, it just reminds us of how how we have the West is comprised of so many different individual and familial stories. It's not just about these big, larger sweeping narratives. That's fantastic. Um, I will also say that anyone who has never had the pleasure and the travail of driving cross country at ground level is missing an amazing opportunity in understanding what is distinctive about the different geographic regions of the United States beyond state boundaries, but also the glue that weirdly enough kind of holds us together. Um, I drove back and forth um, to Alaska um, before I started college. And I, I think I was most impressed by the fact that the further you got from Washington DC, the less it mattered until you got to the other Washington where I was from the wrong Washington. Um, but the nice part was really that sense um, of what an achievement is that we've managed to kind of stick together um, over all of this. I'm curious to know, as each of you wandered through your galleries at your various um, venues or as you've compared notes, um, what kind of takeaways do you think your audiences have had with this? I mean, those of you out in the West, there may be a slightly different perception that there is in the East, but I'm really curious to just have you talk among yourselves a little bit about your perception of how effective um, this has been in shifting people's perspectives. If I, if I can if I can start, um, one of the things that I've noticed that's been really fruitful from having this collaborative exhibition at SAM and being the only East Coast venue for the tour, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these artists are you know not well known on the East Coast and are. Um, really thrilled to have their work shown at the Smithsonian and the fact that we've been able to bring that to 
um, these artists who may not have an opportunity otherwise to come into our spaces, um, maybe in the future, you know, you never know, um, has been really wonderful. You know, getting feedback from, from artists in each of your collections um, personally has been such a joy to hear from them and, and see how thrilled they are to, to know that their work. So while, while that may not be um, a question about the audience or an answer about the audiences, it is exposing their work to a whole new group and, and swath of visitors who um, are, are gaining an interest in, in these, in these, um, these artists. How did it operate out West? I definitely heard some comments sometimes from visitors, uh, comments of surprise of particular mm -hmm. artists or imagery that were included, that sense of, oh, this is different than what I might have expected just based on, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a preconceived notion of what a show that's purporting to be about the West mm -hmm. might show. I really appreciated um, work where we could kind of meet our visitor where they're at and talk with them, especially with, as an academic museum. So we're the art museum for the University of Oregon and my colleagues at, in Utah are an academic art museum. And I know our other colleagues also serve you know, student audiences. So opportunities to also have conversations with students who bring from their studies and sort of critical examination of, of everything they're learning in different fields outside of art and the humanities, but we had students who were coming from political science, native and indigenous studies, geography, all these different fields um, mm -hmm. who had an immediate perspective on what works were talking about, what they were presenting that wouldn't have been the same as, as me coming at it from the lens of someone who's looking at it from an art, you know, art standpoint. And so that was a really rewarding part of um, welcoming, welcoming them into the gallery. And one of the things I love to do with the, you know, the film piece by um, Ortiz that Anne was talking about is remind my student visitors who might maybe are in their early 20s, what age the artist was when he made that and oh, that wow. he was using a film that was popular and only had been made six, seven years before he made that artwork. So they might be looking at the date and think, well, 1950s, you know, how long ago was that? But if yeah. you Think about what was a blockbuster movie 10 years ago? What if an artist completely, you know, turned that on its head and made sort of commentary on that? And then they then they could make that connection right away of how um, avant-garde and how exciting that work is and why it works as well as it does and why it is still as strong an artwork in 2023 as it was when he introduced it. Fantastic. Um, I have a question. I, I should know the answer to this, but we've got a question from the audience, so I figure we should flag it right now. Is there a catalog for this exhibition? I think our biggest regret is not producing a catalog for the exhibition. Um, you know, it, it was such a challenge even in, even putting the show together over the course of um, a pandemic, but it really was a super condensed timeline for a tour that was meant to open, you know, a year a year and a half, two years after we started planning. Um, and so it, it it is, I think I can collectively say for all of us, it's it's a deep regret that we do not have a publication for the show. Although I will say, I know on Sam's website, there's a fairly robust presence for this. Is that something that each of you was able to do so that there are ways that our audience tonight and your audiences in large can actually sort of dive into the exhibition if you're not able to actually see it while it is on view here in Washington. And I will say, one of the things we learned during the pandemic was how to pivot to digital, how to do programs like this, but also how to make our websites function as sort of significant drivers for the ideas that we were trying to get across in the exhibition and then looking for ways to archive that so that once the show um, is distributed and you all get your stuff back, um, that it won't be as though it just simply vanishes um, into thin air. So Did I mention Eleanor? Yeah. Boise Art Museum was the first museum uh, to show the exhibition and it was July, 2021 through February, 2022, which was a pretty tough time, as you will all remember. And so we did uh, create a pretty robust digital presence, which is still mm -hmm. available on our website. It's under our past exhibitions under many Wests. And we also worked directly with artists to create audio tours. So you can hear directly from the artists oh, that's fantastic. via our website as well. Any of the rest of you want to talk a little bit about how you coped with uh, the pandemic and sort of how you end up 
disseminating this information digitally? I think we coped through the pandemic by leaning on each other and checking in with each other. We, we were meeting, you know, two, three times a week. And it wasn't just the pandemic happening at the time. It was earthquakes and fires and protests and so many things, you know, kids doing homework behind us. And it, it was a lot of things happening at once. And we it humanized this for, for uh, all of us and mm -hmm. brought us closer together than if I think than if we had had a conventional, um, you know, meet up once every mm -hmm. six months. I, I think we, we really did get to know each other on a much per more personal level that way. No, nope, that makes really good sense. Um, I think that I, I hope that's something that was the silver lining for the pandemic is that we all realized we could figure out what our re reserves of resilience were, but also how to kind of reinvent what we were doing for a virtual audience as well as for the audience that walked in through the door. Um, and I think that's been a, a really important thing. Um, before we end tonight, I'm just curious to know whether or not there were any memorable audience reactions during the course of the tour, either when you were wandering through the galleries or during a program. Does anything kind of stand out for you um, as you as you think about the, the long-term impact for both you, your museum, and, and for this project? I have a pretty major one, actually, yeah. <laughs> which is that um, a visitor from our community saw the Fritz Shoulder painting in the exhibition here at the UMFA mm -hmm. um, titled Indian and Contemporary Chair and was so moved at seeing that work hanging in our museum that she offered to donate a work by Fritz Shoulder to our museum. She realized wow. that this kind of work needed to be seen mm -hmm. and needed to be in a place where it was seen by a lot of people and could be used in education programming. Um, wow. So that is one reason, I mean, that's just a major reason why it's important for us mm -hmm. to be giving these artists more visibility um, and just raising awareness about their careers and the incredible work that they've produced mm -hmm. um, about the West and he from here in the West. And I think it's a reminder fundamentally, I mean, there's been a lot of battering on the humanities and on museums in general over the last four or five years. And I think all of us believe very deeply in the value of the work that we're doing, but it is moments like that we realize you can touch people in a way that really has lasting impact and that what we do really does matter. Um, and I think that what I'd like all of us to take away from this is that all of those qualities, both you know the the good ones and the traumatic ones that created um, the the impressions that you brought together from many mm -hmm. Wests, those are things that help shape us as people, but it also shapes us as societies. And I hope all of us take away mm -hmm. the resilience that you built into this project, the resilience that you demonstrated by doing this project, mm -hmm. um, and recognize that what you did. Um, was an outsized effort to get this material into the public eye at a particularly tough time in all of our lives. Um, I'd like to congratulate all of you. I think the exhibition is really quite amazing and I can't tell you enough how much I believe that collaborations like yours are one of the things that is helping to reshape the field. Um, so uh, with that, I will just say, Thanks to you. Thanks to all of our um, audience tonight for sticking with us in this. I think this has been a, a really sort of energizing way to think about how we approach um, museum exhibitions. The next time you go to an exhibition, go in eyes open thinking about the ideas that help bring it to fruition, the way that it's presented to you, the questions that are being asked, um, and really be present in that exhibition for what it has to, to teach us about where we've been, where we're going, and how we're going to get there.